So in the Winds of Winter, we are going to be treated to at least four battles. There will be the Battle of Ice up around Winterfell, the Battle of Steel near Storm's End, the Battle of Blood down near Old Town, and the Battle of Fire over in Marine. Why these names, Ice, Fire, Blood, and Steel? Well, Fire and Ice, Fire and Blood, and Fire and Steel are terms that are paired in our story. And the Battle of Ice involves a winter storm and an icy lake, the Battle of Steel involves Bitter Steel's Golden Company, the Battle of Fire involves dragons. So why the Battle of Blood? Well, that takes a little bit of explaining. Let's go into what we will expect in the Winds of Winter. So all the way back in the Drowned Man chapter in A Feast for Crows, we hear about the prospect of the Ironborn conquering the Arbor and Old Town when Euron boasts at the Kingsmoot that this is something he can deliver to the Ironborn. My brother would have you be content with the cold and dismal north, my niece with even less. But I shall give you Lannisport, Highgarden, the Arbor, Old Town, the Riverlands and the Reach, the Kingswood and the Rainwood, Dorne and the Marches, the Mountains of the Moon and the Vale of Arryn, Tarth and the Stepstones. I say, we take it all. The Ironborn go on to attack the Shield Islands in the Reaver chapter, and it's after this attack that the promise is remembered by Victarion's ally, Red Ralph Stonehouse. Old Town is richer, and the Arbor richer still. Redwine's fleet is off away. We need only reach out our hand to pluck the ripest fruit in Westeros. Fruit? Only a craven would steal a fruit when he could take the orchard. It's the Arbor we want. Now this Reaver chapter is also the first time we get an idea of the Ironborn's force size, as Roderick the Reader mentions a thousand Ironborn ships. Now Victarion takes 100 of these ships to Slaver's Bay, and these ships are the Iron Fleet, the largest and best ships. So in the end, Euron is left with 900 or so common long ships heading to Old Town and the Arbor. Now news of the 1,000 ships makes it to King's Landing in Cersei 7, A Feast for Crows but they are unaware that the 100 largest and best ships have left for Slaver's Bay. As a result, they overestimate the Euron threat a bit, and it's decided that the entire Redwine fleet needs to be dispatched west to deal with the Ironborn once Dragonstone is taken. According to Cersei, the Redwine fleet is 200 warships and 1,000 Carracks, Wine Cogs, Trading Galleys, and Whalers. And in the A Dance with Dragons epilogue, we find that this fleet has made it as far as sailing around Dorne. Now when A Feast for Crows finally closes in Samwell 5, we find that Euron indeed has made good on his promise to attack the south. They are swarming in the Redwine Straits, have sacked Rhymesport, and have taken a number of locations in the Straits, including Vinetown and Starfish Harbor. We also hear about them being based on a number of islands around the Arbor, including Stone Crab Cay, the Isle of Pigs, the Mermaid's Place, and other nests on Horseshoe Rock and Bastard's Cradle. But there is a local resistance, also in Samwell 5, we find out that Baylor Hightower is building ships, and Humphrey Hightower is heading to Lyce to hire cell sails. Now with the release of the Forsaken chapter of the Winds of Winter, we finally get an update on this situation. Months have passed, and Aaron finds himself on the Isle of Pigs, it seems. The Stonehand reports that the Redwine fleet has finally arrived, and Leighton Hightower's sons are coming down the Whispering Sound to catch them in the rear. So it seems Baylor Hightower has finished building his ships, and it's likely that Humphrey Hightower has successfully returned with cell sails. Aaron finds himself among a fleet of three dozen longships plus a slew of captured merchant ships. We do not know where the remaining 860 or so other Ironborn longships are. Some are said to be raiding up the Mander, and the Ironborn have several other locations to guard, but they are largely missing. So on first glance, it seems Euron's forces are vastly outnumbered and outpowered, Three dozen longships and some prizes of war? Up against a vastly superior force of 1,200 ships in the Redwine fleet, of which 200 are warships? Not to mention the newly built Hightower fleet and the possible inclusion of foreign cell sails. Even if Euron's missing 860 longships show up, he's still outnumbered and outpowered. Not to mention, it seems rather clear that the battle will happen in the Redwine Straits. The Ironborn were conquering and swarming there, and the Stonehand talks about being taken in the rear, implying that there are only two open ends, a front and a rear. That leaves Euron at a strategic disadvantage, where he's trapped and unable to escape. Now it should be noted that being caught in straits proved disastrous for the Ironborn in the Battle of Fair Isle back during Balon's failed uprising. And Victarion laments Fair Isle as a huge blunder. The memory of Fair Isle still rankled in the Iron Captain's memory. Stannis Baratheon had descended on the Iron Fleet, both north and south, 
whilst they were trapped in the channel between Ireland and the mainland, dealing Victarion his most crushing defeat. Euron's raiding campaign on its face seems to be a massive folly. The Ironborn are facing a clearly superior force in both physical size and numbers, and they are in precarious surroundings, trapped in straits. And yet this whole move is odd as it appears quite deliberate. Roderick the Reader even thinks about the deliberate nature of Euron's actions in the Reaver chapter. They will come. His grace desires it. Why else would he have commanded us to let Hewitt's ravens fly? So it seems Euron wanted the powers of the Reach to react. And Euron would certainly know the devastating military history of the Ironborn. So what on earth is Euron doing? Why intentionally put yourself in a seemingly inferior position? And how can he possibly win? Well, let's switch gears for a moment and go all the way to the wall and talk about Melisandre. In the Melisandre chapter of A Dance with Dragons, she sees a number of visions in the flames. One in particular is interesting. Then, the towers by the sea, crumbling as the dark tide came sweeping over them, rising from the depths. So Melisandre sees a dark tide and something rising from the depths. Later on, she actually explains this vision a bit more to Jon Snow. I saw towers by the sea, submerged beneath a black and bloody tide. That is where the heaviest blow will fall. So not just a dark tide, a bloody tide. We have blood in the water near towers by the sea. Now Melisandre tells Jon that this is Eastwatch, but in her head she thinks actually her vision didn't look like Eastwatch at all. So where could this actually be? Well, admittedly, lots of places have towers. But as it happens, right on the Redwine Straits, there is a place called Three Towers. And of course, there's the High Tower of Old Town, Euron's stated objective. Sam even spots Three Towers as he heads to Old Town, with ironborn activity all around him. Gilly stood beside the prow with the babe, gazing up at a castle on the cliffs. Three Towers, Sam told her. The seat of House Castain. Etched against the evening stars with torchlight flickering from its windows, the castle made a splendid sight but he was sad to see it. Their voyage was almost at its end. It's very tall, said Gilly. Wait until you see the high tower. Keep in mind, this passage actually comes between a paragraph about Ironborn sightings and a near Ironborn attack, and observing later devastation caused by the Ironborn. If Melisandre's vision is generally talking about conquest and devastation near towers, this seems to fit the bill. But there's actually more to make us think that Mel's vision is about three towers in Old Town. And there's more to make us think that her vision is a bit more literal. You see, Melisandre's vision contained a bloody sea. But as it turns out, she's not the only one to have this vision. Over in the east on the Selesori Quran, we have Makoro talking to Tyrion about a vision. Have you seen others in your fires? Only their shadows. One most of all. A tall, twisted thing with one black eye and ten long arms. Sailing on a sea of blood. So Makoro describes what sounds like a one-eyed kraken sailing on a sea of blood. Of course, the Greyjoy sigil is a kraken, and they are a seafaring house, thus sailing. And Euron does have one black eye, his crow's eye. The reference to him is fairly blunt, and the reader is certainly supposed to think of him. But the more interesting thing is we have a second reference to a sea of blood. But that's not all. Back on the Isle of Pigs, when Aaron was in a dungeon in the Forsaken chapter, we have a third reference. The dreams were worse the second time. He saw the long ships of the Ironborn adrift and burning on a boiling, blood-red sea. He saw his brother on the Iron Throne again, but Euron was no longer human. He seemed more squid than man, a monster fathered by a kraken of the deep, his face a mass of writhing tentacles. So again we have Euron as a kraken of the deep, but most importantly, for the third time we have a reference to a sea of blood. Now we can actually piece the visions of Melisandre, Makoro, and Aaron together to get some picture of what's going on. A sea of blood appears in all three visions. A tide rising from the depths appears in one vision, while krakens, creatures that rise from the depths, are featured in the other two. Euron is specifically in the latter two visions, and towers, in the plural, are in the first vision, which is something that the subject of the latter two visions happens to be near and is intent on conquering. I would say that it's fairly likely that the three visions of Mel, Makoro, and Aaron are all looking at the same thing. Euron, a kraken, bloody water, and towers in the Redwine Straits. Now visions are of course often metaphorical, so perhaps the kraken is simply a metaphor for Euron himself and his monstrous personality. And maybe the bloody sea is simply a metaphor for conquest and death. Maybe, but I keep harping on the fact that we have three visions of bloody water, as in the Ariana sample chapter, we are actually told, perhaps in foreshadowing, 
what literal bloody water does. And Krakens off the broken arm, pulling under crippled galleys, said Velena. The blood draws them to the surface, our maester claims. There are bodies in the water. A few have washed up on our shores. So again, we have a reference to bloody seas and Krakens, though this time it's very much literal. The Krakens are coming to the surface, as in rising from the depths, and the maester claims that blood has the power to act as chum to lure Krakens to the area to then pull under ships. This is our fourth reference to Bloody Seas, and our third reference to Krakens. Now one of the interesting things about the four battles going on, Ice, Steel, Blood, and Fire, is that there are similar parallel occurrences. For example, at the Battle of Steel, the Golden Company will be riding into battle with the Golden Skull of Bitter Steel. While at the Battle of Ice, the Freys will be riding into battle with the Head of Moore's Umber, which looks a bit like the Head of Bloodraven. It being an old man with one eye and a weirwood spear going into it. I bring this up only to point out that our author has some parallel structure going on with the four battles. We can look to one battle and find references to another. Keep in mind Ariana is heading towards the Battle of Steel when she hears about Krakens being attracted to bloody water. And over at the Battle of Fire, Barristan's squire Tumko Lo also brings up the ship's snatching ability of Krakens. Squids. Big squids. Like in the Basilisk Isles, where sometimes they drag whole ships down. Where I'm from, we call them Krakens. So in at least two locations that are somewhat contemporary with Euron, we hear about Krakens bringing down ships. Now it's not just Krakens that have an interest in blood. Euron himself expresses interest in it. He and his cronies speak repeatedly about blood having power. No, I'll not kill you tonight. A holy man with holy blood. I may have need of that blood. Later. For now you are condemned to live. A holy man with holy blood? Aaron thought when his brother climbed back onto the deck. He mocks me, and he mocks the god. So a bit of attention is put on the power of blood here. Our author even has Aaron dwell on Euron's words to highlight it more. Now what's odd is that Euron is an atheist, and yet he speaks of the value of holy blood. Aaron can't make sense of it, and assumes he's being mocked. But why would Euron value blood? And he's not the only one. The crow's eye has fed your drowned god well, and he has grown fat with sacrifice. Words are wind, but blood is power. We have given thousands to the sea, and he has given us victories. This time it's left hand Lucas Cod talking about the power of blood, and Euron giving sacrifices to the sea. Giving powerful blood to the sea. A fifth reference to bloody water. Cod says this among dead bodies that have been hung up and called pigs. Hung up to drain them of blood like butchered pigs? Why else hang them if sacrifices are given to the sea? Again though, this is all curious as Euron is an atheist. It makes no sense for him to give sacrifices to the drowned god. Now both Euron and left hand Lucas Cod are seafarers, and blood to a seafarer is useful as chum. And in fact, we already have Cod saying that they've been feeding powerful blood to the sea. And we have a vision of a bloody sea and something rising from the depths. And we have a second vision of a kraken on a bloody sea. And we have a third vision of ships on a bloody sea and Euron as a kraken of the deep. And we have a contemporary mention of blood drawing krakens to the surface and two contemporary mentions of krakens bringing down ships. It seems exceedingly likely that Euron is going to try to draw krakens to his battle in the Redwine Straits with blood. Euron has declared his value for blood, we have heard about him feeding the sea with blood, we have visions of blood in the water, and we know that blood draws krakens. We even have a curious reference to an army being raised from the deep. So how exactly will all of this go down? Well, as I mentioned before, Euron's fleet is 36 longships plus some merchant vessels. It's these prizes of war that are interesting. Beyond them, a host of merchant ships floated on a tranquil turquoise sea. Cogs, carracks, fishing boats, even a great cog. A swollen sow of a ship, as big as Leviathan. Prizes of war, the damp hair knew. Now the ship that sticks out the most is the great cog, a swollen sow of a ship. It is again interesting that it's described as a pig, something that's butchered. And this is where the parallel structure of the various battles comes back in. Because this is how the Victarian sample chapter opens over at the Battle of Fire. The noble lady was a tub of a ship, as fat and wallowing as the noble ladies of the Greenlands. Her holds were huge, and Victarian packed them with armed men. With her would sail the other, lesser prizes that the Iron Fleet had taken on its long voyage to Slaver's Bay. A lubberly assortment of cogs, great cogs, carracks, and trading galleys, salted here and there with fishing boats. It was a fleet both fat and feeble, 
promising much in the way of wool and wines and other trade goods, and little in the way of danger. Victorian gave the command of it to Wolf One Ear. The slavers may shiver when they spy your sails rising from the sea, he told them, but once they see you plain, they will laugh at their fears. Traitors and fishers, that's all you are. Any man can see that. Let them get as close as they like, but keep your men hidden below deck until you are ready. Then close and board them. The scenes with Euron and Victorian's fleets are near identical. A huge ship amongst prizes of war, cogs, carracks, and fishing boats. It's almost certain that our author made these scenes the same intentionally. In Victorian's case, the merchant fleet is designed to lull the enemy into a sense of false security, allowing them to get close. But hidden in the large ship is an army. So if the parallel structure holds, something is likely hidden in the swollen sow. Could it be blood? Now I will say the Battle of Fire is not the only battle our author is calling back to. If you recall, a very similar strategy was used at the Battle of the Blackwater. Through black smoke and swirling green fire, Davos glimpsed a swarm of small boats bearing down river. A confusion of fairies and wherries, barges, skiffs, rowboats, and hulks that looked too rotten to float. It stank of desperation. Directly ahead, drifting towards her and swinging around to present a tempting plump target, was one of the Lannister hulks, floating low in the water. Slow green blood was leaking out between her boards. With a grinding, splintering, tearing crash, swordfish split the rotted hulk asunder. She burst like an overripe fruit, but no fruit had ever screamed that shattering wooden scream. From inside her, Davos saw green gushing from a thousand broken jars, Poison from the entrails of a dying beast, glistening, shining, spreading across the surface of the river. So the strategy of a large vessel with nefarious cargo hidden among harmless decoys has been used before. With Victorian, it was a hidden army. On the Blackwater, it was wildfire. But also note the animal similarities to Euron's hidden ship. A Lannister hulk, a tempting plump target, leaking blood, gushing entrails of a dying beast. The ship is a huge, dying, butchered animal putting green blood into the water. And now let's think about our swollen sow of a ship. It's clearly hiding something in its holds. Rather than green blood, could it be red blood from the thousands of victims that left hand Lucas Cod claims they've killed? The red wine and high tower fleets would get close, perhaps even ram the vessel, and then the straits would fill with blood. And then would come the Krakens. <laughs> Now with Krakens pulling down ships, I would think that some sailors would try to escape. But this is where I suspect Euron has learned from Fair Isle. With his missing 860 or so longships, he would trap the Red Wines and the High Towers in the Straits. Euron isn't the one getting trapped, he's the one trapping. Now if Euron is trying to utilize Krakens, there is one glaring problem with his plan. He's in the middle of it. If Krakens are destroying ships and pulling them under, What's to stop the Krakens from attacking the Silence and pulling it under as well? And this is an important question. The answer may be something simple like Krakens only go for large ships, long ships are too small. But I do suspect something else is going on, something a bit more supernatural. I mean, something more supernatural than Krakens. There seems to be quite a bit of evidence that the story of Euron and Aeron involves telepathy in a manner similar to that of Bran. The evidence has been sprinkled throughout our story, but it's fairly overwhelming when looked at in its totality. For example, in A Clash of Kings, we hear about someone in Carth with an ironborn name, Eurathon, owning a glass candle, an item used for telepathic communication. And we know that Euron was near Carth around that time. And of course, we know that Aeron has been receiving visions, likely telepathic messages. And Euron seems to know what some of Aeron's visions will be. And Euron has a crew of mutes who are somehow able to operate a ship, a job that certainly requires yelling at each other. Somehow, they're able to communicate. And Euron tells Victarion that when he was young, he used to have dreams of flying from a tower, a dream that is strikingly similar to that of Bran. And we know that Euron has been using a psychotropic drug called Shade of the Evening, which is notably similar to a psychotropic drug, Acorn Paste, that is fed to Bran, and a scented candle that is given to Arya. Shade of the Evening, by the way, is used by warlocks who communicate telepathically in a hive mind called the Undying of Karth. And it should be noted that Acorn Paste is used by the Children of the Forest who communicate telepathically in a hive mind in the Werewood Net. And Euron force-feeds this psychotropic drug to Aeron, who he is keeping alive for some reason. 
and Aaron is kept in the dark, an action that seems to have helped awaken the telepathic abilities of Bran and Arya. And Euron is keeping warlocks, that is, those that practice telepathy, in similar conditions, and Euron is keeping holy men, that is, men who practice speaking mentally to God, in similar conditions. And Euron repeatedly commands Aaron to pray to him, that is, speak mentally to him. And Aaron, after experiencing all of that darkness and shade of the evening, seems to perhaps have a mental connection to the other captives. Now perhaps some of these occurrences can be dismissed, but it's hard to argue with all of them together. Telepathy is clearly part of the Euron and Aaron story, and their story is clearly one filled with parallels and allusions to Bran, Arya, and Danny. The presence of Shade of the Evening by itself shows this connection to telepathy. Now it's hard to say how this telepathy will be used exactly. Perhaps Aaron and Euron's abilities will be used to navigate the battle perfectly to avoid the Krakens. Or perhaps the telepathy will repel the monsters, keeping the Krakens clear of the silence. Or perhaps it's control of the Krakens that's desired, dominion over them like Danny has over Drogon, or perhaps skin changing as Bran does to his direwolf. Whatever the case, I would say it's almost certain that Euron will be winning the Battle of Blood and will be conquering Old Town. And that's what you can expect from the Battle of Blood. If you want to know more about this subject, I've done a line-by-line -line analysis of the Forsaken chapter. I've left the link below. Once again, I'm probably wrong about half of this. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.